Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shelby Switzer. I'll tell you a bit more about myself later. Um, this is from The Lion King. Who's seen The Lion King? OK. Who has not seen The Lion King? OK. All right, well, not surprised at all. Um, so this is going to be a serious talk, but with some fun. Um, I know you heard the word enterprise, so maybe you weren't expecting something this fun. But before we begin, I want to know a little bit more about y'all. So who in the room is in healthcare? Cool, a little bit, awesome. Um, who is working for a startup that wants to work with healthcare companies? Okay, cool, a few. Um, who is working in other enterprise industries? Okay, a lot. Um, and who is working for a startup trying to work in the enterprise? Okay, no one, interesting, okay, well, um, for those of you in the enterprise, hopefully you'll learn a little bit about how difficult it is to work with you uh, because it's really hard. Awesome. Um, all right, so before we begin, a little bit about myself. I am a Ruby software developer. Um, been doing this for six or seven years. Um, I have a background in open data. I also co-organize a conference called RestFest, um, soon coming to Europe. Um, so if you like Rest, come talk to me. Um, I get involved with Code for America brigades. Um, I'm not sure if there's kind of an equivalent here in France, um, but essentially civic hacking, trying to work with local governments to open their data, make um, being a citizen better for everybody. Um, and I also basically do everything with APIs. And currently I work for a company called Healthify, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So at Healthify, we're a startup. Uh, we've been around for almost six years. I've been, I've been with the company for three. Um, we are based in New York City, and our mission is to build a world where no one's health is hindered by their need. Um, what that means is that we try to address the social determinants of health, all the things that go in your health care that are not directly medical. Um, so like your access to housing, your access to food, your ability to pay your utilities. Uh, we have software, so our product is essentially what we call community health infrastructure. We try to build the pipes between social workers and healthcare organizations, and we also build the networks and the relationships um, on our services side. Our customers are across the, across the landscape, payers, insurance providers, healthcare providers, um, government entities that are running local health departments, um, and our users are social workers, primarily community health workers, uh, program managers. Um, and we have seven live integrations, which is a lot for a startup in healthcare in the US. Uh, we're also high trust certified. Is high trust a thing here? Yeah. No. Yes. Cool. Uh, so it's a it's a certificate of security practices. Um, major pain to get and maybe uh, really hard to keep. So we're proud of it. Um, so also, quick question: Who here works with HL7? Do y'all have HL7 here in Europe? Is that a thing? Okay, so I'll explain that too, because um, this is a big part of the story. So in the US, especially, healthcare organizations integrate with other systems using a protocol or a text format called HL7. Uh, this looks terrible, it's just kind of a um, EDI sort of format, um, and it's really hard to work with, it's not super flexible, and it's also implemented differently with every single hospital you might come across. Um, so super difficult to do any sort of integrations with them. So. Why am I here? Well, um, about five years ago, I came to this conference. And I was a developer building APIs, consuming APIs. I was learning about all this great stuff about how to think about APIs as a product, um, how to work with developers, and how to um, really try to understand the business value of APIs, make things really interoperable. Um, and I thought I knew what I was doing. Uh, this was basically me. Um, I thought that when I joined Healthify, I could bring this API product mentality to the healthcare space, to working with hospitals, um, insurance providers. And you know, I thought that you know, I could scare off these lizards, I guess. Um, really didn't know what I was getting into, because once I got into healthcare, this is what I was like. Um, I couldn't use git post put delete. I couldn't use JSON. Um, I had to start using this thing called SAML. Who uses SAML? OK, a little bit some nods, yeah. Um, much prefer just using OAuth, although many people might not say that. Um, and the, the interesting thing is, is that these things that were scaring me, that I was having to deal with, they're not even carnivores. Like, they're not even like, trying to you know, get me. 
Um, they're just these large organizations that are moving really slowly um, and that are scary for someone in the startup space. And frankly, I found myself in the gap. Uh, there were deep, dark shadows. I was being chased by large monsters that really just meant well. Um, and I had no Rafiki to guide me. So has anybody ever felt like this when working with enterprise versus startups or other SaaS companies? Yeah, good, okay. Glad I'm not the only one. So what is this gap? So the gap between the world and healthcare, you can also substitute healthcare probably for any other enterprise company or industry. Um, and I do wanna have an asterisk with world, um, you know, the sassy kind of startup world um, at least. Uh, begins with the greatest common denominator. So out in the world, um, we use JSON over HTTP, now primarily HTTPS, uh, very secure. Uh, but in healthcare, most of our integrations are really just around sharing files still, um, and it's 2018. So we can't expect people to use JSON, we can't expect them to use XML. Thank God I think we're gonna skip XML in healthcare, uh, minus the SAML part. Uh, and it's really just about pipe delimited files, not even CSVs, pipes. Uh, the next thing that's different is the most debated topic. Out in the world, we're debating GraphQL versus REST. Um, there's a whole track dedicated to this tomorrow, you'll see. And out in healthcare, we're actually still debating SFTP versus FTPS. Who's ever had that debate in their company? Okay, a little bit, all right. Um, so it really sucks. And for the optimists out there in healthcare, they want the debate to be about HL7 versus FHIR. So a little bit background, FHIR is the JSON like new version of HL7 that's supposed to increase interoperability in the healthcare space. Um, it's pretty cool, but nobody's doing it yet because they're still on all these legacy on-prem systems that only do HL7. The next thing that's different out in the world, we're kind of doing some cool stuff with standardization. Um, and in healthcare, we're still doing customization. Um, who saw Z's talk earlier downstairs? Was anybody in that one? Uh, well, we had a good point about, you know, at the beginning there was custom integrations, then general APIs, and now we're moving to automated APIs. But in healthcare, we're still way back in customization. Um, that's probably uh, not unfamiliar to a lot of you in here. And a big problem with this is that with standardization, we also get a lot of things like open source tools. Uh, we get faster development. We get shared understanding of best practices. Um, and that's just not the case in healthcare. Uh, finally, kind of along this culture, culture sideline, um, a big difference is naming conventions. So in the world, we like to have fun. In healthcare, we don't. Uh, there's obscure acronyms. I can't ever remember them. I can't explain them. I don't know what they mean. And I've been doing this for years now. And ultimately, the biggest difference is the way that we operate. In the world, you know, as you are seeing from this conference, we're really thinking of APIs as products. Like, that's what everybody's talking about. There's lots of great speakers talk, telling you how to do this. Um, but in healthcare, and the work that I've been doing over the past three years, we can't, it's really hard to even think about products when the mentality is so ingrained in projects. So when we start an integration project, we're not implementing a product. We're you know, getting a project manager involved. We've got all these steps. We have to do all this customization. Um, and it's really difficult to turn this and change the mentality, both for our clients and internally in our organization. But regardless of if you're out in the world, um, if you're in healthcare or another enterprise, um, your users have problems and those problems aren't going away. You're not an island and neither is your API or integrations team nor your product. So you shouldn't think of it that way. Um, and finally, the future is real and you need to plan for it. And what I mean by that is change is real. See what I did there? Yeah, change, yeah. Okay, thanks, appreciate that. Um, so. How do we address this? Well, I'm going to share three principles of design first product thinking, specifically for enterprise integrations and kind of how to take some of the stuff that a lot of people are talking about today and tomorrow and really apply this if you're having to work with large enterprise companies uh, that don't move fast. So firstly, we're gonna talk about your users and problems. We're gonna talk about iterating on the design and defining success and how to measure it. So the first. <coughs> Know your users and their problems. Scar did not know his users. The lions overthrew him, the lionesses. Uh, don't be like Scar. Uh, make sure that you look at all of your user groups, not just your most obvious ones. So at Healthify, our user groups 
Uh, we have kind of four distinct buckets. The first are our end users. These are the people who are actually interacting with our software or potentially interacting with the software that we integrate with. Um, social workers typically high on volume, not a lot of time. They're just trying to get through people really quickly, unfortunately, um, and they're trying to find a way to coordinate care uh, better and more efficiently. Our second bucket of users is our business and admin users and stakeholders. These are the people who actually purchase our product. Uh, they're the program managers, they're the executive directors. Uh, they want to understand outcomes, they want data, and that's really important to keep in mind. They want to know that their investment in our product and in their social workers is uh, panning out financially. Thirdly, our patients. So um, at HealthFi, patients don't usually interact with our software. There's some edge cases and like a small piece of the product that they do. Uh, but for the most part, patients are why we're here, but they're not the people who are directly interacting with us. Um, and I do want to call them out because, you know, they're why we're here, but also because they don't trust the system. They don't trust healthcare technology. They don't trust healthcare organizations. Um, they've generally been screwed by the system or, you know, seen their um, health records just get lost or never shared, all this stuff. Um, they just really lack trust. And finally, developers. And I think this, this is one of the biggest differences, so I'm going to go into this the most. Um, but in healthcare, and especially with HealthFi, uh, our developers who use our integrations are typically project teams. Um, they're analysts. They might be actually integrating with us using GUIs and stuff, not coding. Um, sometimes there's a dev team involved who's actually building out a custom integration with our API. Um, but typically, the biggest thing is that they don't know why they're here. Like, they don't know what they're doing. They have no context on the problem or the domain. Um, and they're just trying to get through this project. They have tasks, they have to get through them. And this was the biggest learning curve for me coming into the enterprise. How do I address the developer user group? So out in the SaaS world, uh, typically what we do is we have user-friendly documentation. We've got tutorials. There's a website that you can go to for the API to learn about it. There's code snippets. There might even be code gen. Uh, there's sandboxes. There's events. We have hack days. Uh, before I was working in HealthFi, I was working in an IoT company. We had hack days all the time to get developers to come hack on our devices. Um, it was great. Free pizza, developers will come. Uh, we had a dev newsletter. Um, we were basically able to guide our product use, aka API use, um, via collateral and dev marketing. Um, and that's just not the case in healthcare. We couldn't really apply a lot of these principles because the developer user group is so different. The difference is that the developer user group in healthcare, people working on enterprise integration projects, they don't know why they're here. They don't really care. Um, it's all about the workflow, and that workflow is determined by somebody else. Um, these developers probably never even talk to the social workers or any staff member in the hospital. Um, so we have to basically guide the developers on what the workflow is, and we have to start there rather than starting at the interface. Um, we have to have a shared drive. We have to take over a lot of the project management um, that I never would have expected we'd have to do. So we have weekly check-ins with people, we have written follow-ups, we make sure that they understand how to use the data and why we need the data in certain ways. Um, we have to speak to their language and to their egos. We'll get to that in a second with a case study. Um, and we really just have to be prepared for hand-holding and relationship management as like, the top concern for implementing APIs in the enterprise. So I'm gonna go through a case study. Not gonna say the name of this health system, just in case they ever find this. Um, so uh, three key lessons we learned throughout this process uh, for this particular health system. This is one of the first ones we ever integrated with. Um, they had an Epic system. I don't, I don't know if y'all use Epic or other electronic health record systems here. No. Yes, sort of, kind, sometimes. Um, so the first thing is we pushed back too hard on their timeline estimate because we were like, just you know, an API integration. Give you documentation, just do it. Um, and that was wrong. So uh, we pushed back too hard. They Essentially, part of the problem is that developers get paid by the project and they get paid by the number of hours spent on the project. So they're not exactly motivated to do things quickly um, and they also aren't motivated to uh, give more accurate estimates of their work. So we pushed back too hard. The IT director at the hospital basically like, you know, that like, you don't know what you're doing. Don't tell me uh, how to do my job. So he deprioritized the build, and then we had to actually start our build for this integration um, six months behind schedule, um, which sucked. The next thing that happened was that we didn't really own project management. We kind of assumed that there was a project manager on their side, um, somebody work leading the developers to make sure things got done. Um, that was actually not the case either. So 
really what we should have done after the second meeting with them was start being their project manager with documentation and milestones doc um, to make sure that they're delivering on progress. Um, the build basically dragged on for six months. So we started uh, the project six months late, took six months, should have taken 12 weeks. So we were a year behind schedule. But that's not even uncommon in healthcare, um, in the US at least. And it's probably not uncommon for other industries. Um, we didn't supply written information about the project's data needs or the workflow requirements. Um, so we kept uncovering scope. Primarily, their developers kept uncovering scope as they learned more about the project. And what we should have done was we should have led in with the project by basically telling the developers and guiding them through what this whole process was, why we had these requirements, um, instead of just kind of assuming that it was their hospital and they had all the context. That um, just wasn't the case. So ultimately, the biggest problem was that we just didn't understand our developer users. And we came into the projects and trying to implement our APIs just totally the wrong way. So the second, um, iterate on your design. Uh, because, you know, baby Simba, babies are like better versions of ourselves. Maybe, no, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, don't say that to your kids, I guess. Um, so what does this actually look like in the wild? Like we talk about this all the time as part of design thinking. Um, and it's really difficult to get right, at least in the enterprise, almost impossible in my opinion. Um, but in SaaS APIs, what I typically do when we have one um, is we focus on the interface. We design first, we build later. Uh, we'll start with an API blueprint or some other sort of design specification. Um, we'll give it to the developers on the other end and like sometimes we'll have a hack night and have people come over and try to hack against this um, spec and then give feedback and say, well actually these resources aren't mo modeled the way that I would use them. Um, and we really care about the interface and the um, specification. <coughs> then we have mock servers, people can use those. Um, we use those in mutual test bed. And then once we finally agree on a design or our you know, API product team agrees on the design, uh, we start building. And the spec is the contract. But in enterprise healthcare, um, there is no contract, um, except for ones that executives deal with. The focus is on the workflow and on data needs. So uh, what we've had to do instead of doing any of this stuff, which is like the great stuff people talk about at conferences like this, we have to do things like ask for screenshots of their software system because we can't actually ever see their software system because it's proprietary and we'd have to pay like a million dollars to ever look at it. Uh, so we have to get screenshots secondhand. Um, we have to do mockups. We use something called Envision to do clickable mockups, super helpful. Um, and we have to make sure that IT is part of workflow finalization. Um, what we've seen happen a lot is that business stakeholders will say like, this is the workflow that our users will like. Um, and then it gets to IT and IT is like, well, we can't actually do that. Um, so then we have to go way back to the drawing board. So we have to make sure the IT is there at the beginning. Um, we've learned that we've had to basically just store everything, store all data that comes in via integrations, um, just in case we want to add things or add features retrospectively. Um, so the way that the way that HL7 integrations typically work is that there is just one continuous feed of data, um, and like it's all event driven. Um, Triggers happen, you get sent data, there's no state really, like I can't query a hospital's record system. Um, I just have to make sure that I'm listening to everything. Um, so we store everything that we listen to, uh, just in case it might be useful later, which it has been. Um, we also try to use a mock server. So we use a tool called Redox, helps us do some mock stuff with um, hospital-like data. Um, and we also try to look at real data as soon as possible. Um, that's something that we didn't really think about because when you're in control of the API in the SaaS world, um, you're often like, you can set some rules around what the data looks like. But that's just not the case when doing enterprise healthcare integrations. Um, that the data could look really weird, you have no control over it, you have to be super flexible. Um, and finally, you have to understand how your customer software systems data models and their workflows relate to your data models. Um, I'll go into this in more detail in a second, but um, it's really important that you develop a lot of domain knowledge of these enterprise systems you're trying to integrate with. Um, and finally, again, the contract is the workflow. Workflow changes, requirements change, data needs change, um, and the specification for how the integration works um, is not actually the contract, and that'll be changing all the time. So one key principle through all of this is don't get into data fights. Um, so with the EHR, or electronic health record, um, just listen to the data it tells you, don't tell don't tell a system it's wrong, treat it as the system of truth, system of record. 
Um, that means be liberal with what you accept. Don't try to impose data constraints because it'll just go wrong um, because there's never a user to fix those things. And usually the user actually has workflow constraints around the data that they use. And I'll talk about an example again in a second. Um, and finally, empower the user to make decisions that your developers can't. Um, this is a really big one. So what we try to do, for example, with duplicate records, if we have two patient records in our system, um, but one came from the HR and one was manually created by a user, then we just tell the users that and let them sort it out. We don't try to do any sort of algorithmic, like automatic merging or anything. Just let the users handle a lot of the two minutes left. Oh, <laughs> shit. Um, OK, moving on then. Uh, phase two is your friend. Um, Basically, if people try to add scope in your integration and you don't want to, just say, no, we'll put that in phase two. Kick the can down the road. It's good. <laughs> but but uh, one tactic for this, though, is that you can say, um, we'll think about it for phase two, but by then we'll also have actual usage and data to know whether it's even necessary. Um, so you can start to make some of those harder decisions and uh, scope addition like once you have real data and people have started using your integration. So keep it simple at first um, and do better build later. OK, so geez, um, shit that happened. Uh, we uh, ignored data models. We didn't really have this concept of a visit or an encounter, but that's a really important concept in healthcare technology. We just ignored it, found out we had to deal with it later. Um, we didn't see real insurance data. Uh, what we found was that in the emergency room setting, hospital workers don't add insurance data quickly. They'll just add fake numbers just to get the person into the system, and they'll add the real data later. Uh, we had to deal with that. Um, PDFs suck. I'm not even going to go into that one. Um, define success and measure it. So um, how do we measure success? Um, so in projects, like people kind of know how to measure project success. Like, did you do it on time? Uh, did you kind of gradually reduce the time to, to deploy or to test? Um, how much developer time did you spend on it because developers are expensive? Um, and how reusable are kind of these projects? How replicable? Um, but with products, we have to think about it a bit differently. Um, we measure things like usage and activity, conversion rates happening with integration or API workflows. We look at patient outcomes, business outcomes, NPS scores. Um, and these are all things that you should be thinking about with all integrations, not this stuff. And some guiding questions for you are, um, did each of your user groups achieve their end result faster with better quality? Especially that developer user group, very important. Um, and was the problem solved? And finally, was this less of a project and more of a product? Uh, so really brief numbers, um, we've been able to build reusable interfaces. Um, we've seen that our integration workflows or things that involve some sort of API interaction um, have 66% more engagement rate. Um, we also see three times higher activity uh, with users who have an integration workflow built in than those without. Um, the difference between like the lowest engagement and the highest engagement is like 10 times, actually. Um, we want to do more measuring, so make sure you're build building, reporting, and measuring of activity into your initial builds. Um, and also make sure that your integrations roadmap is aligned with your product roadmap. This makes it really easy to say no to things when uh, like big clients ask you to do weird integrations. So, all right, that's it. Thank you. Woo!